Ya Abaredes. Can you wave your hands like this to Jesus? For unto the King of glory have we God. We have not come before any man. Jesus, we honor you. King of glory, we lift your name. For there is nobody like Jesus. There is nobody quite like him. There is nobody close to him in the class of God. Only you are God. Oh, we bless you. Barefikus
you and I may know. The Redeemer finished his work. We are not here to finish what he started. We are here to stand tall in the finished work. To walk in the fullness. So it is finished, 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 finished. He said it is finished, 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 finished. I want to hear him. He said it is finished.
minister at a, a, there'll be more from her after the service but for now for bible reading please make welcome a son of this house pastor abel loco good morning church please do stand for the reading of the word of god The Bible reading is taken from the book of James, chapter 4, from verse 11 through 17. And I will read in your hearing from the Passion Translation. Please pay attention to the multimedia screen. Here beginneth the reading of the Holy Read. Dear friends, as part of God's family, Never speak against another family member. For when you slander a brother or sister, you violate God's law of love. And your duty is not to make yourself a judge of the law of love by saying that it doesn't apply to you. But your duty is to obey it. There is only one true lawgiver and judge, the one who has the power to save and destroy. So who do you think you are to judge your neighbor? Listen, those of you who are boasting, today or tomorrow, we will go to another city and spend some time and go into business and make heaps of profit. But you don't have a clue what tomorrow may bring. For your fleeting life is but a warm breath of air that is visible in the cold only for a moment and then vanishes. Instead, you should say, our tomorrows are in the Lord's hands. And if he is willing, we will live life to its fullest and do this or that. But here you are boasting in your ignorance for to be presumptuous about what you will do tomorrow is evil. So if you know of an opportunity to do the right thing today, yet you refrain from doing it, you are guilty of sin. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Our hymn for this Sunday morning is titled, Praise the Lord the Almighty. This hymn was written by a German poet by the name Joachim Nender in the year 1680. And he was further translated to English in the year 1863 by Elizabeth Winkworth. This hymn speaks to every aspect of our lives for which we should be thankful for. Ladies and gentlemen, saints of the living God, join me today to lead us in rendering this hymn, the life-changing ministry of the Lagos Metropolitan Gospel Choir and the Rock Cathedral Gospel Choir.
Metropolitan Gospel Choir and the Rock Cathedral Gospel Choir. And now, a wise man once referred to her, being the chief beneficiary of her ministry, as still waters, the wind in his sail. We simply call her mother. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome the first lady of the House on the Rock, Pastor Ifai Ade Pharisee. Well, if you've had a great time in church Sunday morning already and you're almost ready to go home, just that you know God still has a word for you, go ahead and make some noise in the house. Give the Lord some praise. Make that noise so the online church get jealous and know they're missing out on something. And we welcome all our online viewers to our e-church members and those of you who are worshipping with us for the first time. We are delighted you chose a good Sunday to connect with us. And before you're seated in God's presence, just look at somebody on your left, on your right. If you haven't seen them in a while, tell them how good it is to see them in church. Tell somebody else how beautiful they look. Tell somebody else how blessed you have been by the conference. And then you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Just before we go into the world, a few testimonies just telling of God's goodness. And this is from Mrs. A, and she writes, my show up God is her title. Good morning, Pastor Paul. Good morning, church. A few months back, I was almost homeless. I had left a job that was mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually draining for me. I sent an email requesting for shelter until I could pick myself back up again. I got a feedback immediately and a prayer. I read the mail till the end and said, Amen. And God did it. Today, I have a place to call home. God sorted my bills in full, and I now have a comfortable job also. The job came miraculously, as I had gotten several rejections from previous applications. But God did it just when I thought he was done looking in my direction. He showed up for me as my show-up God. I encourage everyone to just say amen and see God take care of all your needs. Hallelujah. If there's anything you're believing God for, just speak that thing into the atmosphere and put a big amen to it that it is done, it is sealed, it's delivered, and it's on its way to you. I didn't hear the amen. Amen, and so shall it be according to your faith. This testimony is from Mercy, and she writes, My portfolio of testimonies. Good morning, Papa. During a Sunday service in November 2021, Pastor Paul read the testimony of a sister who wrote her testimony in anticipation of the job she was expecting from God before it even manifested. I did likewise, and I wrote my own testimony confident that God would show forth for me just as he did for her. At times when I felt the answers were not coming, I would go back to the already written testimony and reassure myself that God was more than able to perfect all that concerns us with regards to my daughter's education and finances in Canada. With faith in the finished work of Jesus, I would constantly speak over her life and future. To the glory of God, she's already settled in Canada. We cannot fathom how God made a way. Where there seems to be no way in that situation in your life, God is going to make a way and just show up for you. Even when the... Even when the fees seemed like an uphill task, we fully trusted God and everything worked in our favor. We are so grateful to God for his mercies that endure forever. Amen. Isn't God such a good and faithful, loving God? It's one thing to have the capacity. It's another thing for him to just choose to be no. He doesn't take into consideration anything about you. All he considers is the finished work and what his son did. So somebody ought to get excited because you are the next person about to write a testimony. Amen. Well, we came to church this Sunday morning not only to enjoy the pleasure of the fellowship of the brethren, but also to be able to be fed the word of God. And we are so privileged and blessed here that we have one who is so gifted in diverse ways. He's one who knows what, is, what times and seasons we're in. He's one who diligently has 
fed us the word of God Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday. Some people call him coach. Some people call him mentor. He certainly is a bridge builder. He is a collaborator. He's an inspirator. He's one who knows how to motivate. He's one who knows how to congregate people. But above all, he's God's servant. And I'm privileged to call him husband. If you're blessed and excited that you have one such as Pastor Paul as your papa, then put your hands together. Let us thank God for the giver as we appreciate the gift in the house and make welcome our pastor. So, Pastor Paul, are they fasting for the furtherance of today's service? I, I want you to lean over to a neighbor and just smell. Tell him something is about to happen in your life today. And then lean over to another neighbor. Smell him again. Tell him God is cooking in the kitchen of glory and warming up something that was finished before the foundations of the earth. And he's about to explode it in your life at the hearing of the word of God. Go ahead, if you love your way maker, your water walker, your miracle worker, your heavy load bearer, your heavy burden sharer, your light in a dark place, the one whose name is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and they find safety. The one who's your covering in the day of battle, who helps you with the impetus of the Holy Ghost to press the battle to the enemy's gate for a fight you already won before you got here. And if you hear that, help me and tell one neighbor, it's a fixed fight, don't panic. And then if you have eruption in your soul and you know the victory is very secure, then house on the rock. Online and here in situ, I want you to clap your hands, all ye people, and shout to God with a voice of glorious victory. Is that all you have? Really, really, is that all you got? ask you to love about four or five people tell them outside and inside you are splendiferous and it's great to be seated beside a powerhouse full of the glory of Christ Jesus this Sunday morning and only after you've greeted four or five then you may be seated in God's wonderful presence first remark is we are so blessed by the hymnody section of the Rock Cathedral Gospel Choir are they not amazing and I love the way they provoke the other sections of both RCGC and MCGC to keep their game up. Uh, and they're all remarkable. If you do agree, please give me an applausive witness. And the incredible ministry of Ada Ehi and her handsome husband. We appreciate you both. It's good to have you in house. And I'm glad to remark that there will be an after service concert immediately following the first benediction. And it will only consume 30 minutes of your time whilst you let the rest of the traffic exit the parking lots. Listen to some housekeeping, if you will kindly. Happy Independence Day to all Nigerians. We will have something to be happy about soon. Also, very happy birthday to Mr. Tony Yabugwe, HOD of Follow-up and Visitation Department. Last Tuesday, the 27th of September, many happy returns, bountiful blessings to you in every way for how you serve and with the diligence that you execute your duties. Also, happy birthday to our very own Mrs. Onos Ario. Yesterday, the Independence Baby. Come on, stand up, Onos. She's such a blessing, alabaster oil. Come on, thank God for the day she was born. Happy birthday to Deacon Charles Edeki, today the 2nd of October. Uh, many bountiful blessings to you and the returns, may they be just so life transforming. And happy wedding anniversary to Deacon uh, and Deaconess Adiola and Olushola Adeyonju. 
um, such a faithful servant in God's house, just faithful. And he was uh, once director of the RFF, the Rock Foundation Force, and is in now the Red Eagle Cabinet. It's 61 days and counting down to the 2022 edition of the Experience TE17. And this year's edition promises to be an exhilarating reunion of the experience sites at the TBS. We kindly ask you that you continue to keep the concert in your prayers and count down with us, intensifying your prayers. We get closer to D-Day. It's the first Friday in the month of December. Uh, join me this afternoon and acknowledge some special guests uh, in reverse protocol. First of all, all the way from the Republic of South Africa, a dear adherents and special guests to us this afternoon or this morning, Pastor and Mrs. Lawrence Madoda. You're most welcome. God bless you. Do stand, do stand, do stand. And turn around if you don't mind. Turn around if you don't mind. Wherever and whenever you see them, give them a Pentecostal handshake, a celebrative greeting, and a holy salutation. They're doing a great work in RSA. Also, my beloved uh, immediate older sister, the younger of my two older sisters, please make very welcome, Mrs. Adeyeminka Ugundikwe. Good to see you, sis. Amen. Bless you too. All right. Um, well, all the princes of House on the Rock uh, flying the flag of this great house uh, in which there are many vessels, would you kindly stand? I refer to the daughter church pastors of House on the Rock. God bless your church. Would you put your hands together for all of them? Some of them are not here of the 33, I think, or 35 around the country. But they were once you sitting in the pews but God flung them out to plant them in a city. And if you go to any of their cities, you'll find that the essence, the quintessence of House on the Rock and the Christ who we love and serve, Jesus the King of Glory, is properly, properly demonstrated there. And for the work they do in hazardous parts of the country amidst terrorists, armed bandits, uh, um, I don't know what to call them, irredentists, they still keep going and they deserve an even greater applause for hazarding their lives for this great gospel. We appreciate you, we love you. May God continue to protect, preserve you and prosper the work of your hands. And as we consolidate that and perfect uh, the consolidation, we're going to release so many of you across the country, across the city and around the world, except where we have friends and brothers. So I'm, I'm, we're not going to Houston, uh, we're not going to Atlanta. Hallelujah, because I have real friends there. You may be seated. And directing them at the regional level, please acknowledge the regional director for House on the Rock, North Central, Pastor Uche Ahigwe. Good to see you, man. Directing the House on the Rock in the northeastern region of the country, Pastor Yusuf Akila. Bless you. Joseph, Nubian Joseph. <laughs> also, Pastor Edwin Bayebo directing uh, the Southeast, where wise men come from. God bless you, Pastor Edwin. And uh, Pastor Barnabas Arastas directing House on the Rock in the northwest of Nigeria. All powerhouses. And we'll all Petra Coalition pastors, I imagine they're in their Sunday morning services, you're here, just holler at us. If you're Petra Coalition and here, just holler, just shout at us. Okay, just one of you. Bless your souls. Bless you. God bless you. Also with us, a great privilege just being in his presence and his presence being here and contribute so immensely to the oil in the house. Please acknowledge the International Christian or Christ Ambassadors Network of Churches Prelate and the presiding bishop over all the ICANN agencies and the president of the ICANN Global Academy, a school of ministry and leadership of believers called, the mark, called to the marketplace. He's a kingdom consultant and a strategist whose mission is to equip believers for leading roles in every sphere and on every level. His grace, the bishop, Wayne Malcolm. And a dear friend, one of 
the great preachers that I can really trust. Also, to speak to you for a half moment, um, and his lovely wife, a best-selling author, a humanitarian, energetic, enthusiastic, articulate, eloquent, and erudite orator, transformational and transformative teacher, intersectional entrepreneur, interlocutor for many causes, and an upwardly mobile business mogul. He is the founder, CEO, and senior pastor of the Lighthouse Church and Ministries, one of America's fastest growing churches headquartered in Houston, Texas. He stole my church from me in just two services. Please, ladies and gentlemen, with, as he comes with his wife, will you celebrate them, laud them for the deposit they left in this house. Pastor Keon and Pastor Mrs. Henderson as they come for a couple of moments. Well, don't you look splendiferous. Uh, can you praise God for a transformational uh, intelligent, brilliant, eclectic set of leaders. Praise God for your past and first lady. Come on and praise God. Please, 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 please. You know, there's a saying in America that is, it's a sad dog that won't wag its own tail. And uh, we thank God for your leadership and we have been immensely blessed and changed and stretched and challenged by uh, just sitting at table. Do you all know how smart your pastor is? I mean, he can't say anything regular. Everything is so smart. And I just feel so not smart in his presence. He's just, he's just incredible. And to his wife, who is equally as fragrant and brilliant, Thank God for you. I want to see, do you, do you have anything to say before we finish? Um, I just want to say what a privilege it has been to spend the last few days with all of you. But the two of you have been such an inspiration. And like Kiana saying, like to sit amongst you and hear your experiences and all the knowledge you all shared with, just in, shared with us in the last few days has been amazing. So thank you all for sharing these two excellent people with us. Uh, obviously, she looks better than me part of my dress. I ran out of church clothes. <laughs> um, I, I thought I was going home uh, yesterday, and Pastor so graciously asked that we stay, and I thought, it would be amazing to be here with friends. You know, some people come into your life and they never come. And some people come into your life and they never leave. Some come for seasons and some come for reasons. And I thank God that this pastor and his wife have come into our life to change it forever. And we're so honored. Let me say this to you before we sit down. In John chapter number 11, um, we discover the death of a man named Lazarus. And you must study that because there were two men in the Bible named Lazarus. Both of them were sick, and both of them, their sicknesses led unto death. But only one of them was raised. The Bible says the one that was raised was a friend of God. That's chapter number 11. Chapter number 12, you see the same Lazarus sitting at a dinner table with Jesus. And the men of the city conspire to kill Lazarus again because Lazarus is the evidence that God is who he said he was. Let me tell you something, Nigeria. You are not dead. You are just asleep. And the reason why the devil wants to kill this country is because when you get up, you will be the evidence that God is still on the throne. And I want you to know that I am praying and pulling for you because not many days hence the world will know that God lives on this continent and that all life form is spawned from the soil of this place. So be not weary in your well-doing for you will reap a harvest if you faint not. God bless you and we love you.
sentiments are absolutely mutual. Such huge repositories of love, of kindness, truth and faithfulness, erudition, and effective communication of what's on the inside of them. We are privileged to have the Hendersons in our midst. If you agree, we stand to your feet and with honor salute their presence, which carries the fragrance and the presence of our King, His Royal Majesty, the King of Glory. Glory to God in the highest. It is our custom to welcome all of you who are at the Rock Cathedral Paris for the very first time and have not yet been acknowledged to this, this Sunday morning's service. So if it's your very first Sunday worshiping with us at the House on the Rock in Lagos, do oblige us and stand to your feet so that we can properly acknowledge your presence. God bless you as you stand, all our first time visitors. We're delighted to host you and to have you. And I'm going to ask you to remain standing for about two minutes. In the meantime, my name is Paul Adefarasi on behalf of this wonderful church family. We're truly glad, very excited that you were able to make it here this Lord's Day. And that's why we really want to ask you to really pray and say to God, um, where is the house you designed me for and designed for me? Because when you find that house, you will blossom and flourish like you can absolutely nowhere else. Now, there are many great houses in Lagos where you would do well should the Lord lead you there. And I'm happy to recommend a few of the many and they include the guiding light assembly the fountain of life church the daystar christian center the redeemed evangelical mission the redeemed christian church of god uh, the revival assembly and the salem church just next door if god should lead you to any of those houses my personal guarantee is that your life will never ever be the same again because we know the men of God there and we're not trying to build several churches in Lagos. We're building one kingdom and one church for our God in Christ so that together we can help you to unlock, unravel the gift set in you, turn it into a skill set and then collaborate it with other gifts in this house and collaborate this house with other churches in this nation till we make Nigeria the nation whose builder and architect is the almighty God of creation. This is our trust, it's our hope, and as you prayerfully consider, we look forward to working with you to bequeath a better nation than we found to the generations coming behind us that will make God get up on top of his throne and start tap dancing. Hallelujah. And as you prayerfully consider, please remember our doors and hearts are always wide open. It's with eager anticipation. We look forward to having you back as a part of the House on the Rock family. And we have a special reception for you immediately following the concert. Um, and if you will turn towards my right, your left, you'll see a gentleman there at the end of the benediction. And that's the signal to follow him out for about five minutes or so. They'll offer you some refreshments and give you some briefing as to how to integrate with this house. And while Whilst you do that and prayerfully consider, I have a little secret that I'd like to share with you this Sunday morning. As long as you promise not to tell too many people. I really want to be your pastor. I really want to be your pastor. I believe we can do great things together and I look forward to that collaboration. But you are here on a day with a very special treat. Something really is about to happen in your life. And church, if you appreciate our visitors, would you really applaud them till they feel embarrassed? And then friends who are visiting, you may be seated in God's wonderful presence, but remember to please fill out this form and give it back to an usher or take it to the special reception uh, immediately following the service. Wow. What a conference. If you didn't make it here, you either had an urgent excuse or the devil tricked you. But the speakers have just been amazing. Wasn't Bishop Malcolm just incredible and the grace of God in his life? Wasn't uh, Dr. Keon Henderson, wasn't he just amazing and off the chain? And our next speaker, good Lord, phew, he's a scholar. He is so up to heaven and the evidence is in his down-to-earth anointing.
that's so yoke-breaking and limitation-destroying. He is a coach, a certified emotional intelligence specialist, a cultural architect and trendsetter for his generation. He is the founder and leader uh, of the Change Church, a vibrant ministry that impacts people of all ages, socioeconomic classes and ethnic backgrounds. His passion for transformation has inspired the release of his most recently published book titled Relational Intelligence, the people skills that you need for life, for the life of purpose that you want. He's got it all wrapped up inside there. He's married to his college sweetheart, Shamika, and they are the proud parents of two sons, Seth and Gabriel. Friends, full of seminarian, Princeton seminarian, sage, orator, but certainly an oracle, apostolic. And I want you to stand and receive in the name of an apostle to this world. Privilege for us to have him not only in our presence, but as the voice sent to us. Please receive this noble man of God, Dr. Darius Daniel, as he comes. Well, House on the Rock, let's rock this house with some praise. Listen, I am so incredibly excited and honored to be here. I've been sitting all week taking this in, learning, growing. Dr. Darius, Dr. Darius, please forgive me. I, I don't do this, but I forgot to do something very important. You know, he's Nigerian. We looked at his DNA profile, yes. and the majority of his genes are from right here. And I have two little things of, of huge importance to do. I, I personally believe that Dr. Darius is, is Yoruba. So that's Igbos, Kanuris, Anangs, Afangs, Efix, Batamans, Kajes, who are trying to claim you. So what we'll do is we'll take one name from uh, the ethics, one name from the Jebus or Yorubas, and where should the third name come from? From the Angas. All right, um, Keon, we're coming for you in a moment. And so Yorubas will name last, but it will be the first name. So will, will the Angas come, Mr. Garwin, would you come? Would you come? Give him a microphone quickly. And, and so what name would be befitting, and I know you're doing this on behalf of your father, what name would be befitting for a noble man of royal descent from glory that is sent to the nations of the world, specially prepared as an arrow in God's quiver, what name would be appropriate? Tochuku. That's not Angas. <laughs> That's not Angas. It's a joke. It's a joke. I'm like, <laughs> but what does Tochuku mean? Praise God. Praise God. Can I have one of those red hats, please? Just one. Just one. How to do the greeting? <laughs> oh, once, twice, three times. That makes you an Igbo chief. Obuishi, Oyisi, Ezebu, Buru, Buru, Chemba. What else do we have? We also have Osinawata, Buru, Garaya. One. God bless you, sir. That's the first name. The second name will be from the Anang Ethic Kalabari. 
Microphone, please. Okay, since there's an argument, come and argue here. Quickly, 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 quickly. Ubong Abasi. And Ubong Abasi means? Kingdom of God. A king from God. very prophetic. No, I want more do I did go okay, Coca, come and help us. <laughs> you will recommend and I will determine. <laughs> <laughs> so give me three options. Is somebody writing these down? The first one will be Adewale. Shala Yefua. Adew represents the crown. Royalty. Royalty. Adewale simply means that royalty has come back home. The second one will be Ade Tokumbo. But Ale saw Runya into a bit more Bow Kumbo. Okolo Logbewa. She wants to have us up a Ade Tokumbo. Kishi Oku. Biomi. Oku. Bioki. Udabe. What that simply means is royalty has returned home from abroad. That's good. Oruko Keta Ade Uluwa. Ade Uluwa. Profiti on Wotowo. Ade Uluwa simply means the crown that God has bestowed upon humanity. It happens to be my Yoruba name. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please receive the names again. Tochuku Ubong Abasi. Adewale, Ade Tokumbo, Ade Oluwaloju, Darius Daniels, as he comes with the word of God. And we'll do the same for Dr. Henderson immediately after Dr. Daniels is done with his sermon. And you can place the hat on the pulpit. Okay, I was about to preach in it, but... I Thank you so much. Make some noise for my names. <laughs> Woo! I'm going back home and say, y'all have to call me all of that. All of that, all of that. It is so good to be home. And really quick, I know we've been doing it all morning, but can we make some noise for the ultimate expression of apostolic genius, a prolific pontificator of truth, one with an ambidextrous anointing. Come on, the apostolos, the sent one to this nation, the presbyter, the overseer of this house and this movement. He rules well, he's worthy of double honor. Make some noise for your pastor. My friend, Pastor Paul. Hey, and with equal fervor and enthusiasm, I want y'all to give it up for the forever first lady.
grace, anointing, class, dignity, the spiritual mama of this house. Come on, make some noise. Uh, Pastor Paul, when we were talking on the phone about me coming, I told you that what God spoke to me about Africa this year and that it was something more so that I felt like he wanted to do in me. It, it was not that in any way I felt that Africa needed me. I felt like I needed Africa. That there was something that God wanted to do in me. Um, who in some sense feels called to be a, a theological voice to my generation and for my feet to be placed on this continent and this country which has had the greatest contribution to the formation of Christian theology than any other continent in the world. The term Trinity was coined by Tertullian, African. St. Augustine, African. Anthanasius called him the Black Dwarf, African. Origin, African. And there's something God wanted to do in me. And um, I don't even know what all of it is but I know I will never be the same. Thank you for facilitating this. And I'm forever grateful for you and indebted to you. Um, I'm excited about the opportunity to, to share the word. And I'm going to leap right into it. It's been an amazing experience here. It's something on my heart, though, that I do want to share, want to release. If you're ready for the word, say yes. Y'all been getting fed great all week. The business bishop is, he just different. <laughs> Incredible. And uh, what can we say about, in my estimation, the greatest leader in my generation, greatest spiritual leader in my generation in America, Pastor Keon Henderson. It's just been incredible all all week and uh, there's something I want to share so I want to read a few verses of scripture found in the gospel of Matthew chapter number 14 my wife of 21 years sends her her greetings she's being mama she's holding down the fort she's speaking at our church today and uh, she sends her greetings as well and next the next time I come she's got to come with me because she's got to see and experience this Matthew chapter 14 verse number 22 I want to read several verses um, I want to give some context to what's on my heart for today one more time if you're ready for the word say yes, yes. verse 22 says immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd and after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And shortly after dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those 
who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. I want to assign this topic to today's teaching. I want you to help me teach it. Would you high five at least three people and tell them I'm a water walker? Now clap your hands if you receive that already. You can be seated. I'm a water walker. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this, this scripture is more than a scripture. This is a spiritual trampoline that can launch you into levels of living that were unattainable prior to you receiving this revelation. This passage is more than a passage. This passage is a powerful picture, a portrait of a principle that I think is extremely important, yet often overlooked. A principle I've affectionately entitled the principle of exception. And this principle simply suggests for my note takers, write this down, what happens with them does not dictate and determine what happens with me. Yeah. What happens with them does not dictate and determine what happens with me. In other words, previous patterns are not always accurate indicators of future possibilities. That you can't look at what happened with most people like me and tell me what's possible for me. You can't look at what happened with most people my age and tell me what's possible for me at my age. You can't look at what happened with most people my gender and tell me what's possible for me with my gender. You can't look at what happened with most people who come from where I come from and tell me what's possible for me based on where I come from. Because when I read my Bible, I see that my God is a God who orchestrates exceptions. What's an exception, Darius? It's an anomaly. It's an aberration. It's a rule breaker. It's a deviation. An exception is when God makes something happen that couldn't happen, shouldn't happen, wouldn't happen, unless he made it happen. And the Bible is inundated with examples of exceptions. Women in their 90s don't have babies, but with Sarah, God made an exception. Men don't go into fiery furnaces and come out and not even smell like smoke. But with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God made an exception. Men don't go in lion's dens and come out and not be consumed by lions. But with Daniel, God made an exception. <laughs> Men don't raise up their hands, stretch out their staff, and Red Seas part. But with Moses, God made an exception. Men don't walk around a wall once a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day, shout on the seventh time, and a wall fall. But with Joshua, God made an exception. Come here, and dead men don't go in a grave, stay there three days, and get up early Sunday morning. But with Jesus, God made an exception. And I came to tell you, if he did it for Sarah, if he did it for Moses, if he did it for Daniel, if he did it for the Hebrew boys, if he did it for Joshua, if he did it for Jesus, he can do it for you. I want somebody that believes you're next to break a rule, next to break a glass ceiling, next to be the exception, to open your mouth and shout like it's already done. We've been called, created, and commissioned to be the exceptions. I can say this with confidence because I've researched most of the words that the Bible uses to describe God's people and none of them are synonymous with normal. 
chosen, royal, peculiar, anointed, appointed, selected, elected, beloved, head not the tail, above only not beneath, lenders not borrowers, not just conquerors, but more than conquerors. I want to know, am I talking to anybody in the room? That's got a revelation of who you are. I want to know, am I talking to anybody in the room who refuses to settle for normal and natural when God has promised you supernatural? Is there anybody in the room that refuses to settle for ordinary when God has promised you extraordinary? We've been called, created, commissioned to be the exception. And there's a word that can be used to describe those <laughs> who have embraced this reality. There's a word that can be used to describe those who have allowed this revelation to cause a revolution in their life. Th th this word is the word water walkers. <laughs> Walking in and of itself is normal. The Bible says anthropomorphically that God walked in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day. Joshua walked around Jericho. Enoch walked with God. Abraham walked to Mount Moriah. Moses walked through uh, a dry ground on the Red Sea. The disciples walked on Emmaus Road. Jesus walked the Via Della Rosa. But none of this walking compares to the walking we see in the text. Because all of these people walked on land. But in the text, we see two men who walk on what other people drown in. I don't know who I'm talking to today. I said in the text, we see two people who are walking on what other people are drowning in. They are water walkers. Yeah, we, we saw it right here in the text, verse, verse 22. I, I love this. Verse 22 begins with this one word. It begins with the word immediately. Immediately. Immediately what? Immediately after Jesus just performs this miracle with two fish and five loaves of bread. Uh, just after that miracle that the disciples observed. He sends them away because it's time for them to experience one. Immediately, which lets us know that, there, that the miracle they saw wasn't for the purpose of observation. The miracle they saw was for the purpose of education. See, I want you to catch this. The power of miracles is not in miracles themselves. The power of miracles is in the message miracles send to you. So if I get a miracle and miss the message, then I miss the power of the miracle. The miracle says he did it. The message says he's able. So God will give you miracles in your present to give you faith to fuel you in your future because there's going to be something in your future that's going to be so challenging you're going to have to look back at your past and say to yourself he's the same yesterday today and forever and if he did it back then he can do it right now and I want to know is there anybody here that's willing to pause for the cause and look back over your life and see how every time your back was against the wall he came through every time the devil thought he was having his way he gave you the victory every time you were having panic issues God performed miracles in your midst is there anybody that can look back over your life and say he's the same yesterday today and forever 
The power of the miracles is the message. And I want to tell somebody this today, that as consistent as God has been to you, at this point in your life, doubt is illogical. Did you hear what I just said? I didn't say faith was illogical. I said at this point in your life, doubt is illogical. Because when you look at his faithfulness, when you look at his consistency, when you look at his reliability, there hadn't been a time he hadn't come through. I want somebody to just pause for just a second because you owe him back praise for the times he came through that you forgot about. Somebody give him praise for what he did last year. Somebody give him praise for what he did two years ago. It says, I love this, it says immediately he sends them away after he performed this miracle with two fish and five loaves. After he shows them, I don't have to give you more to give you more. That I'll take, <laughs> I'll take what you have. Come here and show you how to use what you have and show you how to have more without getting more. Immediately after that, he sends them away. Puts them on a boat, but he doesn't go with them. He says, y'all go over to the other side. Watch this. While he goes to pray. Text says, when the boat was a considerable distance from shore. After Jesus had been praying hours. The boat begins <laughs> to encounter some waves that, that, that were a result of wind. Don't miss this. <laughs> it was a period of hours. The disciples were rowing or sailing for hours. And Jesus was still praying which means the disciples had a head start of hours but at some point on the sea they see Jesus walking to a place they had to row to they were exerting energy they were sweating they were straining, and all Jesus was doing was stepping. I want to talk to some people who feel like you're behind schedule. Because it seems like some people are ahead of you. And the devil's been telling you, you're never going to catch up. And you're never going to get to where God wants you to be. You're never going to arrive. You're too old. I came to tell you, God is the God that will help you catch up. Somebody open your mouth and say acceleration. Come on, y'all didn't say it like you believe it. I said open your mouth and say acceleration. Yeah, yeah, that's what I speak over your life because God is the God who redeems time. What does that mean, Darius? It means to buy it back. It doesn't mean he give you more time. It means he take the time you got left and he do so much in the time you got left. It make up for the time you wasted. I'm telling you, he can bless you so much in one year that it make up for 10 years that you didn't get blessed. If you believe this is your year, somebody shout. They had a, you could be seated, they had a head start of hours. He was praying. They were working. He was praying. They were want, I, I don't even have time to deal with this. They were wanting to be in his presence, but he had a commitment to be in God's presence. 
because a good leader knows sometimes to help you, I got to put distance between me and you. A, a good leader knows sometimes in order for me to help you later, I got to be away from you now. I got to, watch this, I, like Jesus, I got to make a commitment never to allow my work for the Lord to outpace my fellowship with the Lord of the work. Because prayer is work. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah. They were rowing, he was praying. But while he was praying, I'm not even gonna bother this, while he was praying, he got spiritual stamina. And the spiritual stamina <laughs> that he got from praying allowed him to step speedily to a place they had to row strenuously. I am trying to tell you, if you seek the kingdom first, if you prioritize your spiritual stamina, you will see God get you there further and faster. Uh-huh. A storm is coming. Are y'all all right? Storm is shaking the boat. And they see this figure walking. And the disciples say, it's a ghost. I have a question, House on the Rock. I said, I have a question, House on the Rock. Ask me, what is it? What is it? Here's my question. How can you, how can 12 men be with a man every day, eat with him, walk with him, talk with him, minister with him, be mentored by him, and not recognize him? Maybe it's because God don't always immediately look like God in a storm. This is why you got to be careful how you label things when you're in the midst of a storm because you might be calling it a ghost in one season and then you'll look back and call it God in another season and is there anybody that can look back over your life and say I was calling it one thing in one season but now I look back and say oh that was God I called it rejection that was God I called it a breakup that was God I called it firing that was God I called it heartbreak that was God I called it losing my mind he saved my mind that was God and somebody is in the middle of something right now and the devil wants you to think it's the end he wants you to think it's over but I speak this over your life what the devil meant for evil God will turn it around for your good Somebody put a praise on that. <laughs> you say, I say it's a ghost. Jesus say, no, it's me. Peter says, Lord, if it's you. Give me permission. Bid me. You just green like me. Bid me to come to you on the water. And the Bible says, look at, watch the text. It says, and Jesus said, come. And the text says, then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came toward Jesus. You missed it. Here it is. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came toward Jesus. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, 
walked on water and came toward Jesus. Tech says, Peter says, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. He's not trying to walk on water. He didn't ask to walk on water. He asked to get to Jesus. I'm just trying to get to where you are. I'm just trying to get to where you want me to be. My motive isn't to be different, to be different. My motive is to be where you are. And to get to where you are means I got to walk on some water. You don't become a water walker by trying to be a water walker. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came toward Jesus. The reason some believers can't be the exceptions and walk on water, because come is not enough. If you're gonna be a water walker, you gotta be able to go on a come. He didn't say, come, I'm gonna suspend gravity. He didn't say, come, I'm gonna make the water like concrete. He didn't give him any detail. See, some of us have to have too many details to, to take the step. Sometimes all he's gonna say is come. Sometimes all he's gonna say is move. Sometimes all he's gonna say is leave. And you got to have enough faith to go on a come. Is there anybody here that says, Lord, just tell me to come? The come <laughs> gotta be enough. Because God gives information on a need to know basis. God gives information, watch this, in accordance to our need, not our preferences. He says, Some information you say you need, you just prefer. He said, you don't need to know that. Right now, all you need to know is, come. I can't tell you how many times I had to go on a come. Peter, <laughs> y'all can be seated. <laughs> Watch this. P Peter, steps out of the boat and he walks for a while and the text says he began to sink. And I'm like, wait a minute. And I'll talk about why in a minute because there are a couple of reasons. So he began to sink and he's sinking. Are y'all ready for this? He's sinking because he's trying to do what Jesus did in public without doing what Jesus did in private. Did you hear what I just said? He said, the only way Jesus was able to walk on water is because he spent time praying. He spent time in the face of God. And here is G Peter trying to emulate Jesus's public activity without emulating his private practices. I, I, I saw something in this. I saw something in this. I saw, okay, it's 12 people in this boat. All 12 just saw the miracle with the fish and the loaves. All 12 have seen blind eyes open. All 12 have seen the resurrection of the dead. All 12 are convinced that he's the Messiah. They've left industries. They've given up economy to follow him. But only one get out the boat. Somebody say, I'm number 12. 
I want you to catch this. Peter now distinguishes himself. But he doesn't distinguish himself from the world. Because <laughs> people in the world wasn't in the boat. He distinguishes himself from other believers. Because everybody in that boat was a believer. Okay now, let's shake the theological tree a little bit. It's a powerful picture to us that sometimes we end up staying in boats when you want to be more like other Christians than you do Jesus. Did you hear what I just said? I said, I said sometimes we stay in the boat because we're obsessed with being more like other Christians when just regular Christians don't walk on water. Followers of Jesus are the ones that walk on water. People who are just in church don't walk on water, but people who are part of the kingdom walk on water. And I came to tell you that God's not calling you just to be different from the world. God's calling you to be different also from some people who share your faith. I am telling you God is not calling us, watch this, to get away from immorality. He is. He's also calling us to get away from average. You are too anointed to be average. It hadn't been called to be average. You don't need the Holy Ghost for average. You don't need the Holy Ghost for average. And this is why some of you right now are in a season, I'm getting ready to talk about this in a minute, where you're dealing with anointed agitation. Yeah, you're dealing with supernatural frustration and you confuse because you're like, I'm grateful and frustrated at the same time. I I'm grateful because I see what God's done, but I'm frustrated because something's telling me. Hi, yeah, yeah, I felt that one. Something is telling me that more is on the way. Am I talking to anybody in this room that will say, I'm grateful for what God's done, but if you believe more is on the way, I want you to open your mouth and shout more. Yeah. He distinguished himself from other Christians. Now, I can't speak to the expressions of Christianity in this country. I can speak to the expressions of Christianity in the West, primarily in America specifically. And what I am saying is there is a chasm that exists between the life the Bible promises and the reality we experience. That joy unspeakable and full of glory, we sing about that, but most people don't have that. No, this is not anecdotal, this is data driven. That a group of psychologists actually did a study and the study was to, to discover a word. They took a focus group and the study was to discover a word that would be used to describe the dominant mental disposition of most people in America. And out of all of the words that they came up with, they landed on this one word called languishing. 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 Not thriving. Languishing. Just barely making it. That's, that's data. I'm not judging, but I don't want that. Not when my Bible say he'll give me peace that passes all understanding. I want that. Not when it says that he'll give me joy unspeakable and full of glory. I want that. Not when he says no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I want that, not when he says, I'm not just a conqueror, but I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. And I want all of the people that are satisfied with ordinary and average just to be quiet. But for the rest of us who say, I refuse 
to settle for a life that is less than God's best for me, I want you to raise your voice and I want you to give God a praise that lets him know you want more. I'm almost done. <laughs> Peter distinguished himself. Are y'all ready for this? Peter is a fisherman by trade, which means he's been on the water and in boats probably the majority of his life. But this is the only time where we see Peter making a request to walk on water. <laughs> this is the only time we see Peter making a request to walk on water. Why? Where did this desire come from? Peter has a desire now to walk on water because he got exposed to a leader that was already doing it. Did you hear what I just said? And God will send leaders into your purview as and, and allow you to have a vantage point into some of the things that they are doing, not just so you can admire them doing it, but so you can be inspired to do everything that God's called you to do. This is how I know you've been anointed and appointed to be a water walker, because God's connected you to a water walking leader. Did you hear what I just said? There's no way God wants you to stay in the boat when he's giving you two water walking leaders. And I want somebody that's ready to step out of average, to step into extraordinary, to thank God for your leaders. You can be seated. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's the principle of exposure. God will use examples. He will use exposure to other people's life to awaken an appetite in you for something that you didn't know was possible until you got exposed to it. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, because God knows once you've been exposed, you can't be unexposed. Yeah, that's why me and Pastor Keon said, we threw, we, we ruined, we spoiled, we can't be the same after this. Why? Because once we've been exposed, we can't be unexposed. Because exposure awakens an appetite in you for something you didn't even know was possible until you got exposed to it. God ain't consistently showing you what he don't want to do. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. I said God's not consistently showing you what he doesn't want to do. He keeps putting some things before you because he's trying to get you to see that the same God that did it for them is the same God that wants to do it for you. Now watch this. Watch this. What happens though in many cases is people mismanage exposure. And when exposure is mismanaged, it creates jealousy instead of inspiration. The people that are jealous of you could be learning from you if they manage their emotions properly. Did you hear what I just said? I said some people who are jealous of you need to be learning from you, need to be asking you questions. They're trying to compete. You're not even playing the game. Because jealousy is a result of mismanaged exposure. God's like, I didn't show you that. For you to be mad I did it for them. 
I showed you that as an example of what I can do for you. And I won't see, I'm looking for the hungry today. I want somebody to say, do it for me, Lord, do it for me. Yeah, yeah, I'm not jealous, I'm not hating, I'm not competing. I do not want what you got for somebody else, but I want absolutely everything you got for me. I, I, I see this in Peter. Peter. Peter was different. And so I got a question. How many in the room, in your own way, you feel this? See, it's one thing to, th this is what Paul prayed for believers in Ephesus. He said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know. That you may know. He said that, so what he's talking about there is, I want you to catch this. He says, what you need is, we would call it an epiphany in the States, or a revelation. Meaning that it is one thing to understand something cognitively. Right? It's another thing for you to understand it, it's another thing for a truth to apprehend you. It's when a light bulb goes off and you see something in a way you hadn't seen it before. And I want to know right now who online, who in this room, something's jumping off on the inside of you. This like Mary and Elizabeth, your baby's leaping. Cause down in your soul, you sensing, I'm supposed to be different. I'm not built from the boat. I'm allergic to the boat. I, 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 I can't stay in this boat. I'm getting claustrophobia in this boat. I, I, I'm not judging people who are in the boat. I'm just saying the boat's not for me. I'm not saying I'm better than people in the boat. I'm just saying I'm built for the water. If that's you, just wave at me. Wave at me. I want to see who I'm talking about. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so can we get a little tactical and practical here? Can we get a little tactical and practical? Because I believe I see four things with Peter that if we implement in our lives, we too can be water walkers. Is it okay if we get a little tactical here? All right, okay, I, I, I see here, I see here four traits in Peter. See, you do not become a water walker by trying to become a water walker. You become a water walker by becoming the type of person that walks on water. Bishop Wayne, I deal with this all the time in business space, right? People are like, uh, I want to do more. I want to scale more. It's like, but no, no, no. You can't do more until you become the kind of person that does more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a different kind of person that do it on that level. So I don't become a water walker by waking up and say, I'm going to walk on water. I become a water walker by becoming the kind of person that walks on water. So if I focus on becoming that kind of person, allowing the Holy Spirit to empower me, not just to do, but to become. To, to become. Did y'all hear what I just said? To become. I am telling you, there is a you that God want to introduce you to. There's a you, you hadn't met yet. You Jacob now, he want to show you Israel. You Abram now, he want to show you Abraham. You Sarai now, he want to show you Sarah. He want to show you a stronger you, a wiser you. And I'm telling you, God can orchestrate what we call quantum leaps, which means you can experience a degree of progression in a short period of time that skips logical steps. You can become a completely different version of yourself. And I see four traits here in Peter. I'm gonna give you these. And I'm going to go sit down. <laughs> here, 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 here it is. The, the, these are four traits right here I see in Peter 
of a person who walks on water. Y'all ready? Okay, here it is. Here's the first thing. First thing that I see in the kind of person that walks on water is this. It's a person who embraces their uniqueness. I know this sounds so simple, but it's very important. They, em <laughs> they embrace their uniqueness. It means that they have achieved a degree of emotional intelligence that they are aware of their distinctions and okay with being different. Because how many people stay in the boat because the 11 in there? They embrace their uniqueness. What do I mean by that? When I talk about uniqueness, you've got something called unique design. David said, I've been fearfully and wonderfully made. I put it this way, your personality, I'm not talking about dysfunction, but your personality is a part of your purpose. God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the mother's womb, I knew you. Your parents made you, but I formed you. After your parents did the act to conceive you, they lost all control. Everything else was me. Your strengths was me. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, the timing you were brought into this earth was me. Your ability was me. Your interest was me. I designed you uniquely and I made your personality a part of your purpose. And when you do not know that, you will start changing your personality to accommodate people who are not aware of your purpose. Peter was impulsive, he was unpredictable, and he was temperamental. And it took that kind of personality to have the courage to get out of the boat. If he was judicious and calculated and had analysis paralysis, that personality wouldn't get out of the boat. Stop apologizing for how God made you. And this is what I learned. A lot of people that keep telling you what's wrong with you are just people that are wrong for you. Now, I don't let anybody tell me I'm too nothing. Darius, you too, I'm too nothing. We just don't fit. But God's got somebody that will appreciate who I am. Somebody said, you too stubborn. No, no, no. Nothing wrong with stubbornness. Something wrong when you're stubborn about the wrong thing. Some stuff you got to be stubborn. Y'all better come get me. Jacob got blessed because he was stubborn. The angel said, let me go. Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. You got to embrace that. You really see that? I'm almost done. See, I'm what's called, I'm what's called an ambivert. I used to think I was an introvert, but I'm an ambivert. And uh, it's, it's a person who kind of demonstrates both tendencies. So for me, I need alone time to recharge so that I can re-engage, right? So I don't particularly enjoy alone time once I'm emotionally replenished. Does that make sense? So it's like when, when a person is an ambivert, you can get two completely different people. <laughs> You're like, they can be jovial and joking and then quiet. <laughs> let me, let me, y'all act like I'm the only one in here. Who else feeling me? Wave at me, wave at me. Yeah, yeah, some of you, you have family in your house and they've been over there all day. You go into a room for about five minutes 
and close the door and recharge. Here's the thing. Here's the thing now. That personality is necessary for my purpose. Because part of my calling is what's called thought leadership. So I tolerate, I tolerate organizational leadership in order to exercise thought leadership because my calling is obsessed with the quality of people I produce not just the amount of influence I have so I want to lead people in their thinking which means you're thinking differently after your time with me than you were before okay but you cannot be a thought leader without being a learner and you cannot be a learner if you're not okay being in isolation with books but if all you are is in isolation with books you will be knowledgeable but you won't be transformational if you don't have the ability to take what you learned in private and then give it to people in public so God says I'm gonna make you an introvert so you can get it and then I'm gonna give you an extrovert tendency so you can release it I'm trying to get you to see that you've been customized for your calling you've been wired for your work and you need to stop apologizing for how God made you a Joshua type personality doesn't work with a Moses type assignment you got people who are battered. Moses, that people, they were battered. They were suspicious. They, they were broken. They were wounded. They had to be dealt with delicately and patiently. Joshua was different. Moses like, Lord, don't kill him. Please. Moses like, y'all, come on, y'all. Y'all, come on, please. Come on, y'all. Joshua like, uh, look here. <laughs> Moses destroyed the golden calf. Joshua's like, uh, who y'all gonna serve? Uh, if you're gonna serve Baal, go ahead. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. A Moses type personality brings them out, but a Joshua type personality takes them in. Stop trying to be Moses when you Joshua because a Moses people will try to turn a Joshua leader into a Moses leader. I had to tell my people a lot. I am not Moses now. See, y'all all right? Uh, there's something, Bishop, uh, we teach people in our programs, we teach them how to identify what we call your optimal audience. God is so amazing. He just got some people that's just your people. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, another one they will not follow. If Jesus comes in John's voice, his sheep won't recognize him. His sheep can only identify him with his voice. And that's why the devil wants to rob you of your authenticity. Because if you're not authentic, you can't attract your people. Yeah. It's some people that's just your people. Yeah. And somebody can do the exact same thing you do. They can say the exact same thing you say. And it will not resonate with them the same way. Because God has assigned people just to be your people. Yeah. And sometimes you got to see rejection as direction. It's God's way of showing you these not your people. Embrace, 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 
embrace embrace I don't care what they said I don't care what the ex said I don't care what friends said I don't care what family said I need you to embrace your uniqueness all right I'm gonna stop here listen to this here's the issue the issue the issue with some of you and the reason you can't embrace is because this is what I've learned it's possible to unconsciously assign value to the wrong voices did you hear what I just said yes. see you can't control what people say you can control the value you assign to it That's correct. That's correct. and in my life I made a decision some people's opinions are worth more than others And this is what happens, guys. What happens is, y'all ready for this? Some of you have had David-like situations where, the, where people you love the most saw you the least. See, we don't, we, we don't deal with that emotional trauma that David had to carry into kingship knowing my own daddy didn't even see there's a king in the house. It took a stranger to come in and see what my dad didn't even see. My dad didn't think enough of me to even call me up to be considered. You think he didn't carry that? Why do you think he subjected himself consistently to the abuse that was coming from Saul? Honest. Saul was narcissistic he was competitive he was abusive but David listen the way I'm built you got one time to throw a spear at me yeah I'm not coming back yeah throwing a spear is not a mistake I mean you said a bad word that, that, you said a bad word but that's a mistake you aimed at me bro And David came back. Saul did it twice. Because he got something from Saul he didn't even get from his dad. Because when Saul's initially introduced to him, David's a musician, and the Bible says Saul loved him greatly and made him his armor bearer. So he's subjecting himself to abuse. Because when you've never had love, you will tolerate abuse just to get some love. So you'll manage the jealous Saul just for the few minutes you get with the loving Saul. And because the love is filling a void on the inside of you, you think the loving Saul is the real one. And you're waiting for the loving Saul to override the jealous Saul. But the real Saul is the jealous Saul. This is how, you understand this? So this is how, this is how a man after God's own heart can make such confusing decisions. A man who defeated bears and lions with his bare hands can be in a situation like that. Because he probably like you to you're the first man in my life to, uh, to love me. And there's no way in a room like this and even online, there is no way. It's not possible that there are not many of you who had to dodge spears from those you love. Yeah, I, I, yeah. See, what, that's what happens. When you have a deficit, 
you become a chameleon to get that need met. So you become whatever version of you you think you need to become to receive what you want. So it robs you of your uniqueness and your authenticity because who Saul is that day determines who you got to be. And some of you in this room can embrace uniqueness because you carry in these kind of wounds. And this is what you thought. You thought, and this is the challenge, specifically in America in charismatic churches, who have an unbalanced pneumatology. We think your calling is your healing. And God's like, you call, but that don't mean you healed. My anointing will empower you. God's anointing will empower you to be an usher that will escort other people into a life you miss yourself. Because your gift do it for other people, but your gift don't do it for you. Your heart does. And some of us can't walk on water because we wounded with the kind of wounds we do not talk about enough in Pentecostal and charismatic circles. Soul wounds. That's the worst kind of wound because when you hurt physically, you can see it. But when your soul is wounded, the bleeding is internal. And what can happen is you can succeed in spite of the wound and assume that because you won, you healed. When the quality of your life is determined by the condition of your heart. See, I'm not just preaching this anecdotally. Watchman Nee says, if you're actually undergoing spiritual formation as a preacher, at some point, you'll begin to tell your story using the words of the Bible. So I'm not just talking about Peter here. I'm talking about what I lived through. Winning, but wounded. Winning, but selective conflict avoidance. Winning, but over committing because of people pleasing. Winning, but performance oriented. Meaning my identity, watch this, was attached to my achievements because I only got verbal affirmation when I achieved. So what happens is there were things I achieved that the culture was celebrating that was being driven by a wound. They're like, oh, you saw this. Oh, you saw that. And they have no idea. And I had no idea it was being driven by a wound. Because even when Jesus steps into his ministry, he steps into his ministry with the public affirmation of a father. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased before he performed one miracle. He hadn't raised one person from the dead. He hadn't opened one blind eye and the father said, I'm pleased with you. So now his ministry was from a place of affirmation, not for affirmation. You can't even steward a platform properly if you're struggling with people pleasing. You can't manage a moment like this properly, people pleasing. Because your ear will not be open to what God wants to talk about. If your esteem is attached to your performance, 
you, you limit the Lordship of Jesus. And some of you winning, but you wounded. Because we think being a water walker is about achievement. <laughs> it's people achieving without Jesus. We need to make contribution so we can change culture. We need to make add value in the marketplace because that's what the marketplace values. But then once we get in there, we help them see we are rich where they're poor. If we get in there and we're both poor spiritually in the same place, what impact can we have on them? But Zacchaeus climbed a tree, a rich man, because he saw Jesus rich where I'm poor. He got what money can't give me. He said, I got the best bed. I still can't sleep. I need you. He says, I got all the money I need, but I still feel empty. I need you. It's a quality of life. And the enemy wants to rob you and I that with our wounds. So wounds. Darius, I haven't been wounded. It's two types, guys. There are wounds that you carry based on someone doing something to you they shouldn't have done. That's not the most dangerous kind of wound because you know that. The most dangerous kind of wound in my dealing with people is the wounds they carry not from someone doing something they shouldn't have done. It's the wounds they carry because someone didn't do enough of what they should have done. It's emotional deficits that become personality traits that are not the authentic you. And God says, I want to heal that. One of the most significant miracles you can get is an emotional one. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And my time is up. But I need to pray for you. And I believe I have an anointing to pray for this because I'm not just preaching it. I live this. I lived this. Seven years ago, I woke up hands shaking, sweating, felt like I was literally losing my mind. My wife was alarmed. I could not get my thoughts together. This is 2015. I'm traveling literally all over the world. I got a doctorate degree in my mid-30s. I'm writing my first book. Um, I'm finishing my doctoral dissertation. I'm building two buildings at the same time. Woke up, couldn't even think straight, couldn't stop shaking, couldn't stop sweating. Was never abused. Didn't have a lot done to me that shouldn't have been done, but it wasn't enough of what should have been done. And by all culture standards, I was winning. But by the standard of heaven, I was falling short. And God's like, so all you settling for is some money? <laughs> you settling for influence? That's all, you, that's all you think I want to do in you? And I went on a two to three year journey of digging deep. Get into the root of wounds I didn't even know I had. Never feeling seen. Struggling with inadequacy. Word curses. What do I mean by that? Words that were spoken that had a negative impact that stayed lodged in the confines of my memory. I couldn't remember positive stuff, but I could remember the negative. Tormented. And God worked an emotional miracle 
I did the work, but he did something supernaturally. He changed me. Did you hear what I said? He changed me. He gave me the greatest gift he's given me after conversion is the gift of contentment. I'm content. I'm only obsessed with my assignment. That's my only obsession. <laughs> and people have said things to me like, you're not ambitious enough, you're not that enough, you're not that enough. I'm clear. <laughs> you see, see, talent is what you can do. Passion is what you like to do, but purpose is what you're supposed to do. And when you don't do what you can do, that's an evidence that you're clear and that you're content. When you don't do what you can do, that's evidence that you're clear and you're content. Jesus himself told Peter, if I wanted to, I could call for legions of angels, but just because I can doesn't mean I should. Because I don't have to prove to these people that I'm stronger than them. Now I'm done. <laughs> this is all God want to give us today. I want to pray for you. And uh, it's too many of y'all to do this the way we do it in America, so you just got to stay where you at. <laughs> all right. As many of you that feel like you need to, I want you to get as close to this altar as you can. Bring your stuff with you. Bring your stuff with you. God's gonna work an emotional miracle. Because you cannot walk on water until you embrace your uniqueness and you cannot embrace your uniqueness until he heals your soul. I want you to listen to me. The person that broke you is not coming back to fix you. Some people in my life hurt me and I held my healing up waiting on an apology from people who don't even believe they wrong. They hurt me and mad at me. And the Holy Spirit said to me, Darius, your brokenness is not your fault, but your healing is your responsibility. So I'm gonna say something to you that I want you to receive. It's the principle of representation. Adam represented all of us. Jesus represented all of us. Let me stand proxy and say something to you that you may never hear from the people you want to hear it from. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You shouldn't have had to go through that. I'm sorry. Nobody should have to endure that. I'm sorry. It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. I'm sorry. Lord gave me a revelation. My my father to this day, his, um, his pinky finger won't extend all the way out. Because when I was a teenager, we were playing basketball in the backyard one day and I came down and 
I heard it pop, I broke his finger. He was old school, he never went to the doctor. So it healed, but it healed wrong. Watch this, it no longer hurts, but he still doesn't have full function of it. And that's where some of you are right now. Some of you are in a season where it no longer hurts, but your heart look like my dad's finger. You don't have full function of it. So my dad went to the doctor recently to look at getting it fixed. And the doctor told my dad, I can fix it, but in order to fix it, I'm going to have to break it. And she told him, if you let, if you let it hurt one more time, it'll never have to hurt again. And some of you have pushed your pain back into the recesses of your mind. You don't think about it. And the great physician, God, it's like, if you let me touch it one more time, I'm going to heal it and I'll never have to touch it again. You need to bring your hurt to him and some of your pride won't let you admit they hurt you. Say, I don't want to give them the power to know. No, they hurt you. And the reason you're not reaping in joy is because you didn't sow in tears. Those that sow in tears reap in joy. God can't heal pain. You hide. But he brought you to this service today because you're no longer going to carry this with you. I'm about to pray and God's going to give you an emotional miracle. I know he can. He did it for me. The prerequisite to heart healing is forgiveness. Because unforgiveness makes you worthy of the same judgment you want God to show the person that hurt you. So I want to pray for you, but I want to help you. I was at this retreat center working with this lady, doing some intensive emotional work, and she asked me a question I'm going to ask you in just a second. We were walking through some of the wounds I had, and she said, Darius, I'm going to ask you something. I said, what? She said, do you receive the blood of Jesus as full and satisfactory payment for what they did to you? I said, what? She said, what they took from you, they can never repay. I don't care how many times they say I'm sorry. They can't, they can't give you back the tears you shed. They can't give you back the nights of sleep you lost. So Darius, I need you to write this off as bad debt. To say, you owe me nothing. Because I accept the blood of Jesus as full and satisfactory payment for what you did to me. You owe me nothing. Your debt has been written off. Yes, You've been pardoned. I got closure from God. So I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to pray. Do you accept the blood of Jesus as full and satisfactory payment for what they did to you? I want you to close your eyes right now and think about the wound that was afflicted upon you. And I want you to open your mouth and say, I forgive you. Say it. I forgive you. I forgive you.
forgive you. I forgive you. Now, all over this place, I want to raise, want you to raise your hands toward heaven. Now, great physician, wonderful counselor, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would heal the brokenhearted. That you would bind up their wounds. I pray that you uproot roots of bitterness and malice and anger and resentfulness. I pray that they would empty their hearts of offense so that you can refill it with your joy. And with joy they will draw water from the wells of salvation. Now, great God, heal right now broken hearts. I pray for emotional miracles all over this room. I pray for spiritual surgery. I pray that you would take hearts of flesh, stone, and turn them into hearts of flesh. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, God, that you're releasing them from the bondage of unforgiveness. You're freeing them from the prison of conformity and that you're pushing them into the next version of themselves. Your word says where the spirit of the Lord is, there's a liberty. And we thank you that liberty is all in this room. And he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. We declare we will never be the same. We are healed in Jesus' name. Now I want you not just to shout, but I want you to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Be healed. Be delivered. Be set free. I said shout like he healed your heart. Shout like he broke generational curses. Shout like strongholds have been broken. Shout like you will never be the same. general, the great physician, that he has wrought through the physician you heard speak today. May it never leave us. I don't think there was one person in this room who hasn't just had an encounter with the great physician. Because a man, hold it, hold it, we're not looking for the applause. As a man who has experienced success, wealth, 
honor, acclaim, fame, success in his assignment, realize that none of that stuff satisfies. So you only exacerbate the wounds that men cannot see easily. When we keep chasing success, thinking it's the medication for wounds with which we were afflicted, sometimes self-inflicted, sometimes malicious intent of others, sometimes the wounded wounding the unwounded and just proliferating woundedness. I almost don't want you to clap or applaud because somehow we miss the opportunity in the loudness of an applause to express our deepest appreciation for what God sends our way. He must love you guys. And he certainly loves me to go fishing all around the world looking for the right man to bring to this conference for the particular or peculiar assignment that he would contribute to this weekend of meetings. Not exclusive to the other gifts, but I want you to deeply appreciate a man who couldn't even empty out all that was in him. Hold it, I'm not, hold it, hold it, hold it, please. He treated the text judiciously. He found our souls in their hiding places. Spoke to our need for authenticity. Helped us to pull the masks off our hearts and our faces. Because if you don't show the doctor the bunion on your knee and you show him the callus on your finger, he can't heal what you don't show him. And sometimes showing him what's behind your armor of mail is a difficult thing because you've identified as the armor, not the person in the armor. And many of us go to sleep wearing our own armor. It's difficult to sleep in armor. But it takes a strategic and tactical physician. A physician is an internal doctor. He deals with the things on the inside that are killing us to do so expertly at work so that it's not even him. It's the great physician working through him. In whichever way you know how, wherever you are seated and those of you online find a way, I want you to applaud God hold it for the gift he sent and I want you to applaud the gift for allowing God to make him the first experience of the experience of healing that went beneath the surface of our countenance to the source of our countenance deep down inside of us. Please appreciate the God of Dr. Darius Daniels and Dr. Darius Daniels of our God. You bring tears to all our eyes. The authentic issue of our hurting souls. And because of what you said today, we will not allow culture to define us. Only the manufacturer can. Thank you for serving him so brilliantly. If I could look full in his face, not because you performed the surgery with exactitude, but because you found pleasure in only pleasing your master in fulfilling the assignment to Lagos and in continuing to fulfill the assignment to the world. On behalf of these people who are listening now and those who will listen in later days to come, allow me to speak on their behalf. We love your heart and the God in you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Please go ahead and give full expression. And I want to make an open confession to you this evening, this morning. Sometimes you're the surgical nurse in the surgery. And the, the head surgeon may have other surgeons whilst they're opening up the body. The anesthesiologist is there. And it's possible that the same surgery that the patient is getting, the surgical nurse needs. And whilst we celebrate who got healed because of the surgical intervention, we miss a healing ourselves. Let that not be the case with any of us, pastors especially, who are the surgical nurses. Don't let the week end. It's just begun. Go without finding private solitude somewhere in the full hearing of today's message and allow the chief surgeon to work through the message of the messenger to do a deep work. I believe of all the many things Jesus did outwardly in healing outward infirmity, that was the rabbi at work. But he was also called the great physician, the great internist, internal physician. Because that's where the real work is. It's the strong spirit of a man, the healed spirit of a man, that fixes everything else. Thank you, Dr. Darius. And we all want to come into that season where we're not performing for men. But what matters the most to us is that we did the work deeply where he wanted it done the most. I believe that all other aspects of wholeness start with internal healing. Please allow me a few moments would Pastor Kian, would you kindly come, please? And Sean A could, could join me. And can I have the other hat? Bless this hat. He bless this hat. Um, again, my wife says that Pastor Keon and I have, I don't know if it's a bald head, but we have some resemblance. Um, and so I, I won't exclude the Yorubas from this. Uh, so, uh, Pastor Goke, we'll need you again. Oh, Dilly. I'll use you this time instead of Pastor Goke. Come, if you don't mind. And Musa, I'm not going to use you this time because you were confused. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go to. Do I have anybody from the Bachamans, the Kaje, the Kanuri, anybody from Mid North or Far North? Bachaman, would you come, Pastor Barn? Or Pastor Yusuf? I want something in the Hausa language. House is, is great. And um, then uh, we've used Ethic, Ibo. Um, what about Isoko, Ishekiri, or Yorubo? Ishekiri is Yoruba. Could you, could you help us with the name that you consider befitting, come up, come up, honor him. It's befitting for what this great man represents to us, what he represents to us. Uh, I would say, who did to God, who did that the kingdom is in our hands. Say it again. Who did to God, which means that the kingdom is in our hands. Explain, elaborate, elaborate. 
Okay, um, basically what it means is that um, we belong to a kingdom and we are constantly searching for the expression of that kingdom in our experience and in our reality. So when you say Uvietubore, it means that the beginning of that experience is now within grasp. I need a scribe to make sure you capture all this. Um, and then for the Hausa speaking people. Don't Hallelujah. Abraham is Abraham. Mm. Abraham is our father of faith. So Abraham is the house of version of Abraham. I don't want a version. No, it's I want an indigenous name. Yeah, that's Ibrahim. Ibrahim. No, that's, that's a translation. I want uh, an indigenous house and name. Okay, then give us an indigenous Bachaman name. Pastor Yusuf, can you help me? Okay. <laughs> okay. Pastor Yusuf's house has deep. Please forgive us for that. It's an important moment for us. Uh, I know it's important to you, but it's important for us. Because our brother came home. Our brother came home. Huh? Okay. As long as it is indigenous and it has meaning. My grandfather, in our dialect, Guangzong, warrior. S say it again. Guangzong. Guangzong. Yes, it means warrior. Someone who has returned from war is the one that is accorded such a name, who has many victories. Well, it's not just everyone, but he has to have won many victories to bear that title. So that's not just a name, it's, it's a name that is titular also, it's a title, it's an entitlement. Don't go anywhere. And for the Yorubas, my tending is towards Adegboyega, unless you have an Adegboyega. Oh, yes, there it is. The first name. No, only one. Only one. Aderi Bigbe. The crown has found a resting place. Ade Tosoye. It means the crown. It's a day to so ye. It means the crown is entitled to the throne. A day to so ye. And a day ye means deserving of the crown. So, in every major township or Yoruba dominion, you have different ruling houses that come from an original ruling house and they rotate the crown and the throne through those ruling houses for every tenured king. And what he's saying in Ade Tosoye is that your ruling house and you in particular uh, are up to the throne, that it fits there. Is that correct? Okay. And then Ade, the last one. Ade Yemi. The crown royalty suits me. The crown, the pinnacle of royalty suits me. And I want to give witness to that in the English language by simply saying, these three men that came from foreign shores, it is not ordinary. It's not, it's not merely coincidental that America's two finest preachers in this generation happened to come to this house at the same time, the same way that Peter and John 
went to Samaria after both Jesus and Stephen had laid some foundations to do a restorative and healing work for our country the fruit of which you will see in the ensuing days weeks months and years and before decades are upon us you will see a significant level of restoration of the Nigerian soul and it's with that please help me Sam and I need all the names I need all the names Sam help me with the microphone on behalf of the land of your origin And his DNA also makes him more Nigerian than anything else. It's our pleasure, not in our own behalf, but in the behalf of the peoples of our country, to place this crown on your head. And Africa would have many great names for a real king, but this is just a small sample of how Africa sees your birth into this continent as an apostolic voice to our peoples that we unwittingly like Joseph sent you away to another land and you've come back as a king to help make us kings welcome home Joseph Uvie Tobori. Uvie Tobori. Ade Tosoye. Ade Yemi. Keon Henderson. Of the people of Nigeria. Welcome home. And when a king comes to the throne, his wife comes with him as queen. And being previously of Igbo uh, ancestry, now of paternally Jebu nationhood, my wife has advised, and we accept, that uh, uh, Lady Shone is now, as far as we are concerned, an Igbo queen with the name Shinyere, which means, which means, Ada, come and tell us what Shinyere means. God's gift. Wow. <laughs> oh, ngozi chukwa maka. What means the blessing of God is beautiful. GC <laughs> Ye ye awan, where's GC? Ye ye awan, um, the kingdom of heaven. Yalode. Okay, do Yalode. Yalode. Okay, so which one? Ye ye kingdom. Give me your so that I'm part of the family. So after I do something that is kingdom. Okay. Uh, so you can't give the second before the first. You have to give the first. Baba and Joe of Christmas. Yeah. Who stays in the garage? That's it. I take it, boy. Join your Lua logo. Ogo. Isato, 
That is the, the, the assignment that, that God has given. It's the basis for what we're going to Christian them by. Ninu ijo ni le Yoruba in the congregation of the righteous in Yoruba land. Awo ye kwa. There are some titles that are conveyed on the righteous. Iya ijo. Ah, lepe olori ijo ni baba ijo. Awon ni alufa ijo. <laughs> what that simply means is there is a place for the laity and then there is a place for the clergy. As pastor is the leader of the clergy ah le pe won ni baba ijo olori ijo ni won amo fun awon mama a le pe won ni iya ijo nitori awon ni won ran olori ijo lowo simply mean that we can refer to you as the mother of the congregation because of your dual responsibility of being both wife and also co-pastor. Nitorino Gegebiashe Tiba Ba Timi Tofumi Neoru Kongo Asoyini Iya Ijo. Interpretation simply means because I have been, what's the word now? <laughs> Instructed, and duly so, by my own father, we christen you, Iyaijo, which means the mother of the congregation. Iyaijo, which means by implication you are the prelate of the congregation <laughs> and the congregation is not a singular house it's the whole diaspora and indigenous congregation yeah. ladies and gentlemen please receive the alofaijo and iaijo and tell you what my name is <laughs> Can you just, um, Darius Daniels just um, was a practitioner in this room today and dissected the word of God with such precision uh, that I, I believe it deserves just another round of appreciation. Just incredible. 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 Pastor Paul is in the military uh, he was in a situation where he had to surrender and he lifted his hands in Germany and was shot through the hand. And for the rest of his life, he died with a broken finger like Pastor Darius, his father. But his problem was he died with it broken, never consulting on how to get it fixed. And when you were preaching, it almost brought me to tears because I saw my father's hand. Um, as it would hit the pulpit on Sundays, uh, never, never straightening out ever again in his life. And he passed away a few years ago. So that word that he preached, I said to Pastor Paul, I said, um, he's left the pages of the text and has gone into his testimony. And, and then we got an opportunity to see how God is going to continue to use him to help all of us. Um, in that regard, uh, what he didn't tell you is that all of his life, 
all of his life, and this is the part Pastor Darius didn't tell you because it wasn't his assignment at the time, everything that God has done in his life from the point he did the work was within the seeds that he had sown throughout his life. I know personally that he has blessed people over and over and over again out of his own fruit uh, to ensure that they had homes and houses and food. Um, I believe that uh, there is one thing left for us to do today, and that is to make sure that we sow into what we just heard. I'm going to give you a story. Praise God for that. I'm going to tell you something. I was in a restaurant in Orlando, Florida, and sitting at a table was Bishop T.D. Jakes, Bishop Noel Jones, and about six or seven other pastors that if I named you would know them just off of the knowledge of their name. And Pastor Paul, I was getting ready to walk out of the restaurant, and all of a sudden, Bishop Jakes, who I'd never met a day in my life, stood up from the table and said, somebody stop him. And as I was walking out of the restaurant, Antar, his assistant, came and touched me on the shoulder and said, Bishop Jakes uh, wants you to come over. And I came over to him with because he had been a childhood hero of mine. And he looks me in the face and he says, you've been asking God to meet me. And I said, yes, sir, just give me a moment. I went to my bag and I pulled out a book to show him that when I was 14 years old, my mother had prophesied over me that I would be a son of Bishop T.D. Jakes. Still have the book to this day. One of the things that my mother prayed over me is she would pray over me as a child, Lord, somehow connect my son to the bishop. I had no way of getting to him. I had no way of meeting him. Somehow I'm in a restaurant eating carrot cake. And he asked his armor bearer to bring me to him. I went to him and he looks at me and I and he says, and Pastor Paul has the same look. I saw it today when he was standing on the stage. It's kind of a side look. It's, it's, it's not right at you, but it's from the side. And he looked at me and he said, uh, from the side, he said, um, I'll deal with you, but don't waste my time. He said, give me a call. And, and we're, we're getting ready to give. This is a story about what a seat will do. I walk out of the restaurant and he said, give me a call, and I was excited. Bishop T.D. Jakes wants me to call. I get to call Bishop T.D. Bishop didn't give me a phone number. So I run out of the room, out of a side door, right there from the first row, answer the phone, and this is what I hear. Hello. This is Bishop T.D. Jakes. Is this Keon Henderson? I said, yes, sir. He said, I just finished listening to five of your sermons on the Internet. He says, you are an Olympic swimmer, but you're in shallow water. He said, if I had preached the sermon, this is what I would have said. And for the next 30 minutes, standing in the heat of Dallas, 110 degrees outside, I listened to Bishop T.D. Jakes regurgitate one of my messages back to me, and it forever changed my life. Now, I am in Dallas at this time. He invites us over to his house to attend one of his birthday celebrations. I get to the house, here we are, we've got all of the ministers, like you sir, standing up front. I am in my 20s. I only have 50 members in my church. I've got $111 to my name. And I am listening to all of the preachers say, Bishop, I'm going to start off the birthday giving with 25000 I'm going to start the birthday giving off with 50,000, 15,000. It went on and on and on. When it got to me, I said, Bishop, I have $111 in my pocket. They gave you 50, which was a portion of what they had. I'm going to give you everything I have. And I said, I.
I don't know what $111 equates into Naira, or Naira, but I do know. <laughs> but I'm about to ask you to do it. I don't know what the, what the market is doing today. But I want every person in this room who came prepared to give to stand up on your feet. I want you to stand up on your feet if you came prepared to give. And for those of you all who say, you know what, I want to, I want to sow that same exact seed so that God can break a cycle in my life. You know, God can never... And I can tell you right now, as a 41-year-old man, I owe no man nothing but to love him. I have no debt in the world, all because I understand that as long as the earth shall remain, seed time and harvest time will never fail. I want you to kind of make all checks payable to the house on the rock. If you're given electronically, the details will be on the multimedia screens. If you're giving a physical offering, kindly put your seed in the envelope and pass it down to your right. The ushers will receive the offering from the back, from the priest in each row. 